In the past, I have talked about the importance of zoos and ex situ conservation in the protection of species, though maybe focused a little too much on the video game Zoo Tycoon. So I felt it was about time I talk about the conservation of species in the wild, in situ conservation. I actually have worked both in situ and ex situ conservation projects, and even where they intersect in the release of captive bred animals into the wild. So this is pretty exciting for me, and I guess gives me some actual authority to speak in this video. So how are in situ and ex situ conservation different? And what unique challenges come up when doing conservation out in the wild? On the leeward slopes of Mauna Kea grow dry forests dominated by the scrubby mamine tree. These leguminous plants have bright yellow flowers which eventually transform into these very distinctive seed pods. Protected by powerful toxins, few organisms would even touch them. Despite that, however, mamine are the primary food source for a critically endangered bird, the polila. Using their stubby hooked beak, these finches can pierce the leathery hide of the bean and extract the seeds. Somehow, these birds can ingest the toxic seeds which are so poisonous they would kill any other similarly sized animal in minutes. Once, similar birds were found on several islands in this remote island chain. Today, of course, they are entirely restricted to one small geographic area of the Big Island. Ensuring such a rare bird survives in the wild is a difficult but important task requiring many in situ conservation strategies. So let's explore an area specifically protected to preserve the polila and discuss the basics of in situ conservation. You can barely see anything out there. Um, but I'm here at the Palila Forest Discovery Trail. This forest, um, this is a fenced-in area um, within the range of a critically endangered bird known as the Palila. So just brushing off any potential um, seeds so that I can enter the forest. How does this work? Okay, some quick vocab. Anytime conservation work is done within the natural occurring or formally naturally occurring habitat and range of an organism, it is in situ conservation. In situ being a Latin phrase which translates to on site as opposed to ex situ or off site conservation, which occurs outside the natural habitat of an organism, such as in zoos. See my previous video. Pretty simple to remember if you don't mix them up in your head, as I constantly do. Anyway, let me ramble on about in situ conservation in my in situ footage. Am I using the phrase in situ too much already? Oh, I open it. <laughs> a little bit of a step. Oh, birds. There's birds right there. I don't know if they're Palila. It's really hard to tell because of all the fog. So this forest protects a grove of mamine trees, which are a kind of leguminous plant. You can see the alternating leaves, uh, the alternating pinnate leaves, sorry. Um, you can see the beautiful yellow flowers and the seed pods, which are the, the primary food of the palila. Um, as you can see, they're fairly Legumin they're very leguminous looking plants because they're leguminous plants. That doesn't make any sense. It's basically just a leguminous tree. Um, the seed pods are um, fairly standard sort of bean looking seed pod. But you know, leguminous is my favorite word, so uh, I have to see how many times I can put it in this video. So the first thing you might notice is this patch of habitat is entirely fenced in. This protects the native vegetation from those pesky large invasive ungulates like goats and pigs who want to munch on them, protecting plants that are either critical for the polila or almost as rare in their own right from being eaten by herbivores. Now this is a fence just meant to keep large mammals out. It cannot stop smaller ones, such as rats or mongoose, from entering this patch of forest. This is why there are live traps for them everywhere. Now, of course, uh, invasive species removal is important in uh, in situ conservation. It is one of the strategies. And here we have a tomahawk trap in order to catch uh, invasive mammals. Constant trapping hopefully reduces the local density of these mammals 
and so hopefully reduces nest predation on palila eggs. Of course, much more effective fences exist that can keep all mammals out, but are very costly. Such barriers were perfected by New Zealand conservationists in the knots and used to protect forest preserves from mammalian interlopers. These fences have a cap over the top so no animals can climb over and mesh under the ground so it cannot be dug under. One such fence protects this colony of lace and albatross on the island of Oahu, allowing this colony of seabirds to thrive despite being on an island infested with egg-loving invasive mammals. These small, using small to describe a seabird larger than like almost all others seems wrong. Anyway, this not as large species of albatross spend most of their long lives roaming the North Pacific, only touching down on remote islands such as those of Hawaii to lay eggs and raise young where these majestic denizens of the ocean skies are forced to the ground where they have about as much grace as someone trying to run a marathon in snorkeling gear. Back in the Mamanay forests, after searching the habitat, I finally found the yellow-headed palila. If you take a closer look at the individual I managed to film and photograph, the bird has bands, one aluminum and three colored plastic ones. Bird banding, or ringing as the Brits say, is a common monitoring and research tool in avian conservation. Fine mesh nets are put out, birds blindly fly into them, then wildlife scientists pull them out and affix little government-issue aluminum bands with a unique sequence of numbers to the bird's leg, and then send the bird on their merry way, like this red-tailed hawk I released a few years back by gently tossing off a cliff. The data makes its way to a central repository, so if the bird ever gets caught again anywhere in the world, the bird can be looked up. This allows conservationists to assess individual bird health and life events over time and can also be used through mark recapture to estimate populations or, by taking averages from many birds, one could develop a better understanding of the population's demographics. But to read the number, you usually need the bird in hand. So this is where color bands come in. These little pieces of plastic allow specific study or conservation groups to identify individuals they are working with. So, by looking at this image of a palila, a conservationist could tell you all about the data on this specific bird, without needing to read the numbers on the aluminum band. Each group of researchers reads these combos differently, and has different codes for the color bands. Based on my experience with color bands while doing in situ work, I would read this as aluminum, yellow, yellow, black. Anyway, if you noticed, the primary goal of in situ conservation strategies is management and monitoring. Fence forests or remove predators, then monitor the population as birds do their thing, and then reassess and alter management as needed. Being out in the wild, in situ conservation has a range of challenges not found in ex situ conservation. Protecting a whole forest and animals on a landscape with predators, people, and the elements is far more challenging than breeding some birds in a cage. Fencing in an entire forest is great but it needs to be checked constantly to ensure it doesn't fail. I mean, fencing anything, no matter how small, out in nature is a challenge to keep secure. To lower pressure from nest predators, trapping needs to be done constantly. Basically, in situ is a ton of work, takes lots of time and many people, and so costs a bunch of money. Conservation always has limited funds, and so each penny has to be used wisely. Probably why many so-called conservation silver bullets have been proposed such as biodiversity hotspots and umbrella species. Then, of course, beyond money keeping the conservation work going, you need people in charge to do what actually needs to be done or the government to actually enforce the conservation laws they have on the books. And in the 1980s, conservation organizations took Hawaii State to court to make sure that they did. So after decades of feral goats and sheep devastating native Hawaiian ecosystems, the Hawaiian government planned to eradicate them starting in the 1920s. While effective at driving down the numbers, these animals were not fully eradicated, and during the 1950s, the post-war economic boom and increased time and interest in leisure activities saw these feral animals become game for hunters. The popularity of hunting in Hawaii at the time caused the state to shift from eradication programs to hunting management, and ensure there were enough animals for hunters to shoot at sustainably, and so this ecosystem began to be degraded as ungulate populations grew. Conservationists knew fences were needed, but money wasn't being allocated to build them, so environmental NGOs sued the Hawaiian Department of Land and Natural Resources on the behalf of the Palila for not upholding the law of the land, the Endangered Species Act. 
The plaintiff, the Palila, won the case with the district court finding the state of Hawaii had violated the ESA, and thus Hawaii was ordered to begin steps to eradicate sheep within the next few years from the range of the Palila. This lawsuit created several important precedents for environmental issues in the U.S. legal system, such as NGOs being able to sue on behalf of a species and the ESA having power over state land management. Despite the monumental efforts in the courtroom and out in the Mamane forests, the Palila continues to decline and Mauna Kea is still home to ravenous herds of ungulates. From the jungle to the courtroom, overcoming challenges to in situ conservation takes many forms. One particular aspect I am super excited by is the emergence and the implementation of tech to monitor populations and determine the best way to manage them. Radio collars, in some cases, are being replaced by GPS collars for really in-depth, sometimes three-dimensional tracking. And some of the tracking tech is getting so small and lightweight they can be placed on songbirds, allowing better understanding of migration routes and key habitats. Drones and satellites can be used to study everything from elephants to seabird colonies or whole forests of trees. Then, the development of sophisticated algorithms and artificial intelligence means they can be employed to identify animals on a camera trap or locate diseased trees remotely, and more. Maybe praising AI will get the YouTube algorithm to look kindly on this video. Even though I have only been involved with in situ conservation for just a few years, the rate of developing new tools is astounding and I can't even imagine what might be possible in another decade, and what data we can collect to inform management decisions. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. I would highly encourage watching my earlier video on ex situ conservation as a companion to this one, as Palila have been bred in captivity by the San Diego Zoo and then released back into the wild, though not in numbers high enough to really push the population numbers up, and unfortunately, the species is still in decline.